Good morning. And this is the second lesson on physics. So we'll put a number two there. Could you put the title? Mass versus weight. Now this is going to be a lesson of two halves. Each one should take about half an hour to fill up your time. Um, so this is the first title, mass versus weight. And it's one of those real misconceptions in everyday life that everyone just uses the words for the same thing. So you have a mass and you go on a weighing scales and you have a weight and people use the two terms interchangeably and that is not true in science or in physics. So hopefully in half an hour's time you'll have a really clear understanding of what mass is and what weight is. So your mass here there is a hundred kilograms of mass on a barbell. Now obviously when it says who is stronger Earthling Phillips or Moon Man Phillips. Well, I agree with Moon Man Phillips is a Moon Man. Um, obviously, Mr. Phillips wouldn't be lifting 100 kilograms. He only wishes he was as hench as me. Um, but, you know, it's something for him to aim at and we should all have aspiration. So here is 100 kilograms of mass. And here is 100 kilograms of mass. And even if that barbell was over here off in space. So there it is. With the weights on the end even if it was over here and it wasn't near anything there would still be a hundred kilograms of mass that is that doesn't change the mass is the amount of a substance there is so that will never change however weight will change weight depends upon where you are now earth is about six times bigger than the moon and because it's six times bigger that means that the force of gravity pulling things towards it is also six times bigger. That means that this has a much, remember we use arrows for forces, this has a much bigger weight on Earth than it does on the Moon. So on the Moon, if Mr. Phillips really could lift up a hundred kilogram mass on Earth, well on the Moon he'd be able to lift up 600 kilograms he'd be six times stronger because everything weighs six times less because the moon is a much smaller object and if you went to a bigger planet so if you went to a much bigger planet which is heavier gravity than earth actually you could only lift a lot less so the difference between weight and gravity, well, I think it should really say weight and mass, but weight is the force caused. It's a weight is a force and it is caused by gravity or it's due to gravity. And gravity is the force of attraction by any large mass. Now, you need things of the size of the moon or a planet, etc., to be able to measure their gravity. So, the bigger an object, the bigger its mass, the more gravity it has. The gravity caused from the sun, so here we go, little diagram again, I do like my pictures. Here's the sunny sun sunshine and obviously in Teletubby style it has to have a big face and say hello to the Teletubbies in the morning. The force of gravity from the sun is so big that the earth is held in orbit around it. The earth is attracted to the sun but it's moving and the earth goes round the sun once a year. That's what causes our seasons etc. On a different planet years are different lengths so a year might be 500 600 days long because it takes longer to go around it's further away so there's less attraction of gravity so it moves slower but the sun is such a large mass it has a much bigger gravity now in terms of lifting a mass this is a 501 kilogram mass so the next thing to put in your notes is that when we measure mass 
the standard unit for mass is a kilogram. And we can break that down because that's a thousand grams or it's a thousand thousand milligrams. So we can have other versions of grams, but the standard unit mass is measured in kilograms. And your weight or any weight, which depends on where you are, is a force. And forces are measured in units called Newtons. Now, most of you know that from key stage three. And the symbol for that is a capital N. Right. Mr. Phillips made this PowerPoint. And what I've noticed so far is there's lots of pictures of big bulky men. Um, obviously, like myself, Mr. O'Neill, etc., very hench. But, you know, that's just science teachers for you. So, what causes weight? Well, weight in an equation is caused by your mass. So, weight is mass, but then it depends on where you are. So, what we call that is the place where you are, whether it is the moon or Venus or Mars or standing on the surface of the sun getting very hot toesies, that is called the gravitational gravitational be bad if I made a spelling mistake in that gravitational field strength. So now for those amounts we need units. So weight is measured in newtons and mass is measured in kilograms and gravitational field strength is measured in how many newtons per kilogram. Now that triangle if we just use the first letters or not triangle as an equation if we just use W M and G we can put that into a triangle to make it easy to rearrange. So weight is the mass, it should be a small m, mass times g gravitational field strength. There we go. Now what that means is all I have to do whenever I'm doing any questions on this is first of all, step one of any equation on this is I'll check with the numbers that the exam question has given me, is it in newtons or is it in kilonewtons and I need to transfer it? Is it in grams or kilograms because I need to transfer it to kilograms first? So I'll make sure that my units are correct. Then I can put my numbers into an equation. So please make a note of that equation. Make a note of the triangle and make sure you're OK with rearranging that. If I want to work out the mass, for example, here, that means that mass equals W divided by gravitational field strength because these two are above each other. So if they're above each other, they're dividing. If they're next to each other, they're timesing. But I know you know that from previous science and from maths. Oh, get rid of those bits. Oh, it's a surprise. Another bulky Mr. Phillips picture. So, on Earth and on the Moon, different gravitational field strengths. I need to change colour pen again. Let's go for a nice purple. So on the Moon, if I want to work out the weight of this 220 kilograms deadlift, well, Earth has a gravitational field strength. Earth GFS equals, I'm going to say it's 10 newtons per kilogram. And that's just a rough number. Actually, it's been recalculated and it's 9.8. But we'll use 10 for now and just know it's 9.8. Usually, for the moon or for anywhere else, that would be information given to you in a question. The moon gravitational field strength is 1.6 newtons per kilogram. So what that means is this 220 kilograms on Earth, if we've got weight is mass times gravitational field strength, that means that on Earth it's equal to 220, uh, 220 times by 10. 
and that equals 2, 2, 0, 0 newtons. A mass of 220 kilograms times by the gravitational field strength for Earth, 10 newtons per kilogram, is 2,200. What about on the Moon? Now on the Moon, I'll have to use my calculator, so excuse me for a second. I uh, have my calculator at the ready almost now. So on the Moon, I've got the same mass, 220, but the Moon is smaller, its gravity is less, I'm only timesing it by 1.6. So I type in 220 times by 1.6 equals 352 newtons. The other way I always remember this, just go on a slide, and there's the f equation I've just done in a triangle. The way I remember this is, here's me, like I said, quite hench. Oh. Usually quite happy, uh, and I've got hands, and oh sorry feet, oh and I sometimes have a hat, but I haven't got one on today. Um, I weigh seventy-five kilograms, as in I have a mass of seventy-five kilograms. See, I've just used the wrong word. I don't have a weight of seventy-five kilograms. I have a mass of 75 kilograms and because it's a gravitational field strength of 10 on earth all I remember is I actually weigh 750 newtons you might want to try it at home yourself if you've got weighing scales however if I went to the moon then that 75 doesn't get times by 10 it gets times by 1.6 the gravitational field strength of the moon so what I'd suggest you do is if you have got a scales at home or you roughly know your weight in kilograms and if you only know it in stone you can convert it to kilograms just do it on Safari or Google. So when I do 75 times 1.6 equals 120 newtons I weigh six times less on the moon that means and this is a good picture to put in your head I can jump six times higher on the moon than I can on earth. If I can jump a metre here, I would be able to jump six metres high. And the way I usually explain this in school is, that means I could jump from reception to the maths corridor. Just pop up there, have a chat with Mr Fuller, and pop back down. So, just go through this one, sorry. Get rid of that, get rid of that. Okay, here's some questions. So, would expect you to be able to go through these now. Toby has a mass of 80 and in your notes already you've got what the gravitational field strength is of Earth, so that's easy. Rudy, the puppy, has a mass of 2.3. What's their weight on Earth? So again, so that's simple timesing it by 10. What's the weight of this spaceship on Earth and on the Moon? Quite easy question so far. How much does this weigh? It's no different. It's in kilograms, so it's right. You don't have to convert it. And then once you've done those, I would write a key definition for what weight is, what mass is, and what gravity is. And then different questions. Question three here, for example, you need to work out that one kilogram on planet Zog weighs this. So what have they done to this 0.1 kilogram to get to 15 newtons? Hopefully you work that out. And therefore you just rearrange the equation. So this time round we've got gravitational field strength is equal to the weight divided by the mass. And you'll get that. OK, obviously it's going to be higher than Earth's gravity on planet Zog. Everything feels heavy here for question number four, but try those, work through them. Let your teacher know through Google Classroom if you're struggling with that and then send your work through for that first half of the lesson. Now.
sorry, extra questions for those who want it. And again, the second part of the lesson is resultant forces. So if you now change and put a different title, resultant forces. And the idea with this is, here's me, and this is actually my car. This is what I drove to work in today. I'm not sure about the scarf, but I just, you know, I can rock it. Oh, and I did have my glasses on. That's better. So, driving to work today, if you look at the forces on this, well, there's a force from the engine pushing the car forward. So I can draw a nice big force there. But then, what's hitting me is air resistance. The air I'm hitting is giving me drag. If you want to feel that, wait till the car's going fairly fast and put your hand out the window and you can feel your hand being pushed backwards. So there's that force of friction, the drag. Then there's a the force of friction here on the tyres because they're in touch with the road. So they're rubbing against the road and they're losing some of their energy. So there's a force that way backwards. Then what's keeping me in touch with the road, there's a force acting down. So I've got a force of gravity pulling me down to the road. But the road is providing a force so that I don't sink into it. So tarmac and hard road surfaces are a bit... That's a rubbish arrow. One second. That's better. So actually, there's lots of different forces acting at any one time. However, if we were to look at the numbers behind those, maybe here, the resultant force overall, putting all those arrows together, the resultant force overall, because these ones are balanced. So down here, these two are balanced, so I'm not moving up or down. The arrow going forwards is really big, and the arrows going backwards are not as big. So actually, overall at the moment, I'm going that way. Hence why I actually got here in time to be able to make this lesson. And same here. Here, with a jet engine, I've got a much bigger force going forwards. But then, because I'm hitting more air, you wouldn't want to put your hand outside that air jet airplane. Probably rip your arm off. Or in my case here, I'd probably rip my head off. Um, we've got a force of gravity pulling the plane down. But then we've got a force from the wings, because of the shape of them, causing lift, lifting the plane up. So actually, again, this plane hopefully won't be going up or down at the moment, but overall, it's already moving quickly forward, and because these forces are balanced, it will continue moving quickly forward. That R here, the overall direction going forward, that's the resultant force. So the overall force that's acting. So to work these out, I'll go past this for now. To work this out, if you were asked what's happening with this object, well, that force, this trolley is being given a push of 60 newtons and 30 newtons, both in the same directions. So the resultant force is 90 newtons. They're going in the same direction, so we add them together. Here at the top, you've got 30 newtons going this way and 10 newtons going against it. What's the resultant force? The resultant force is 20 newtons to the right. This one here, you've got on this side, 120 going to the left and 120 going to the right. So even though it might be moving, the resultant force is zero newtons. And I can't see the bottom one because recording this, my video is in the way. So. When they draw diagrams like this, this could represent anything. If I put, that's a car, that's a boat. It doesn't really matter. It's just using that square in the middle to show an object. So could you work through these little sketches and what's the resultant force? So this one, for example, there's two forces of 103, both going in the same direction. What do you do with them? This one, four newtons going that way and one newton that way. What does that mean overall? So work through from A to G, do little sketches and write the resultant force next to them, please. And that'll be in the work you submit to your teacher. And then 
the higher tier part of this, so if you're foundation, you're mostly done, but the higher tier part of this is very similar to what we did in lesson one when we drew vectors. So what you do on here is, ah, we are told that there's a force and you draw a scale diagram. So at 30 degrees, there's a force acting and we draw a scale diagram. If we want to break this up into separate forces, to get to this point from here, there must be an overall force acting this way and this way. So what we can do is we can determine the horizontal part of the force and the vertical part of the force. And then you can just put your ruler next to these lines and measure them. So whatever scale you decide, whether you decide that one centimeter equals 10 newtons, it doesn't matter, or one centimeter equals 50 newtons, it doesn't matter on the scale you use, as long as you use the same scale each time. So here, they've used the simple Pythagoras one, so two, three, four, so, oh, it's not two, three, four, is it three, four, five? But here, the overall force going this way is made up of a force that way, and that way, it's just been drawn over here at the moment. Um, that's two centimeters. And over here at the top, they've got a scale. So that two centimeters means, ah, 120 newtons this way, and three centimeters, ah, 180 newtons that way. Oh, find my key. Okay, typical type of questions on this. So you'd have squared paper and you'd be provided with that on your exam paper. And then what you would do is, so this is a force of 250 newtons and at 25 degrees. So what I'm hoping by now is you're realizing you absolutely need to use your calculator. And it's good if you use the one that you're used to in maths for any sort of physics questions and papers. And the other thing that you'll need is a pro tractor for drawing angle diagrams. Okay, try and answer A, A and A, very cleverly labelled there. And then the exam question below, see if you can make sense of that. And that's where you let your teacher know if you need support. Now, just to finish off, Isaac Newton, the father of physics in a way, as some would say, Isaac Newton has laws about movement. And if you read this one, this is exactly as he was it. When the resultant force on an object is zero, the object will remain stationary or continue to move at a constant velocity. What that means is you need a force to start an object moving. You need a force to slow an object down. You need a force to speed something up, stop something moving or change direction. If I draw this, ooh, and if I've got a car moving really quickly along the road, 70 miles an hour, and then I've got all this force, and if I've got a force here of 2,000 newtons from the engine, and I've got 2,000 newtons worth of friction or drag forces holding the car back. Those forces are balanced. That means the resultant force is zero newtons. And Newton's first law is when the resultant force is zero. This doesn't mean that the object is stationary. That it just means that it moves along at a constant velocity. So, an object sitting still on a desk, here's a desk, here's a ball, the ball is attracted to the desk, the desk provides support for the ball, they're equal, the desk is not throwing the ball in the air, and the ball is not breaking the desk. That is an object that is stationary. So here, it, the resultant force is zero newtons, it stays stationary. Here, so example A here, on a desk it stays stationary, and B. You need to learn all three of Newton's laws. So this is the first one that you need to commit to memory. So worth writing that out, 
making sure it makes sense in your own mind with a couple of diagrams and making it memorable. So, questions. Quite often, an exam question would be, state Newton's first law, state his second law, state his third. We'll get to them. This one. How can we tell this object is accelerating? Well, if it was going at a constant speed, the forces would be balanced. How can we tell it's accelerating? Because the force to the right is bigger than the force to the left. And this one, how can we tell that this object is at rest or at a constant velocity? And that's because 30 this way and 30 this way gives a resultant force of zero newtons. And Newton's first law is if we have zero newtons, then it must either be at a constant speed or stationary at rest. Uh, free body diagrams. I'll flick through these. Pause, make notes when you need to. Same sort of idea. Two newtons there of tension in the rope here. 16 newtons. Going forwards for the lawnmower, 12 newtons there. And so the free body diagram showing the resultant force. For that lawnmower one that you just did, so you can go back, these are the answers to the previous slide. And these are just some exam questions to trial. Okay, thank you for listening. And hopefully, I know that was quite long, but actually there's quite a lot of explanation there. And we're aiming at you getting the best possible grades, remember.